Hey there, how's it going? Let's cut out the small talk here and strap ourselves in because this is one of those videos that has a very seemingly simple question and a very deep rabbit hole, mind blowing, crazy answer. A few months ago, somebody asked me, since the air is so much thinner, would you sound quieter on the top of Mount Everest? Let's go. Well, this is pretty easy. After all, the intensity of a sound can be found out by taking the sound's frequency and squaring it and then multiplying it by the density of the air and then multiplying it by the speed of sound. However, the speed of sound changes depending on the temperature, and we all know that the temperature on top of Mount Everest is pretty extreme. So to figure this one out with any level of precision, we need to know the properties of the medium. However, the medium is the air on top of Mount Everest, and the air density is affected by the temperature, and the temperature is affected by the air density. And this becomes my favorite type of video to make, a deep dive. Now, if you Google this stuff, you'll find a whole lot of answers. Is sound louder in cold air? In chilly air, sound is amplified. In which season sound is louder? Sound will be louder in warm weather. Does sound travel better in cold or warm air? Warm temperatures. Do speakers sound worse in the cold? Absolutely. Okay, this is already a mess. So our first main question, is sound louder when it is hot or cold outside? We're going to define sound by an acoustic pressure being perceived by the average human being. And if you watched my video on the loudest possible sound, you know how much of a mess even that becomes. But for now, we'll just use decibels and distance. And what is cold? Physically, there is no such thing as cold, only absence of heat. And that sounds very zen, and it kind of is, but more importantly for this purpose, the term cold is just a handy way of saying, man, there's a comparatively low level of kinetic energy being transferred around here. So generally, sound carries better in cold air than it does in warm air. You may have noticed that on a cold winter night, you may have heard a distant train or traffic a bit louder than you would normally hear it on a summer afternoon. Throughout my life, I've heard a wide range of theories for why this is, one of them being that in the cold, atoms and molecules are further spread out, therefore they dampen sound less. And I've even seen a high school science teacher set up a set number of dominoes and then spread them out to show that that energy carries farther. Now that particular metaphor would be contingent on quite a few things, but more importantly, any effect you would get from that would be eclipsed by the effect that you would get from refraction. Now if you've ever heard your own voice echo, you know that sound reflects but it actually bends too. So sound waves, just like light waves, can bend or refract whenever they are slowed down or sped up. And the direction of this bending is predictable. If we imagine that a line is perpendicular to the surface or boundary, that's referred to as the normal line. If light is traveling fast and passes through something slower, like glass or water, it will bend towards the normal line. If it's traveling slow and transitioning to a faster material, it will bend away from the normal line. This is due to the least time principle, which is pretty simple. Light and sound prefer to take whatever path takes the least time to travel, even if it doesn't make rudimentary geometrical sense to us. So if today were a hot and sunny day here in Georgia, the molecules around me would be moving around faster and therefore sound would be traveling a bit faster through them. Now let's say I had a balloon and I let it drift about a dozen feet above me in the sky and it pops. The sound would disperse as you would expect. However, it would bend a little bit upwards towards the sky because the air is colder there. As a result of this, somebody standing 100 or 200 meters away from me would actually hear the pop a little bit quieter than if they were in a chamber of even temperature. Now in colder days, and especially colder nights, pockets of warmer air tend to hover a couple hundred feet above the ground. And so if I popped a balloon in this very field in my hands, the sound would disperse upwards, but then refract or bend back down. So if you're standing a couple hundred meters away, it's safe to predict that you would hear it louder. So with the temperature of Mount Everest getting as low as negative 76 Fahrenheit or negative 60 Celsius, it might be safe to assume that the the temperature portion of our problem would make your voice carry farther, except for the tropopause. Now, as we all know, the tropopause is a thermodynamic gradient stratification layer that marks the end of the troposphere. Or in English, we walk around and exist in the troposphere. The higher you go, the colder it gets. That is, until you get into the stratosphere, where it actually warms up significantly the higher you get. Now, the tropopause actually changes in height depending on the latitude and season. So does Mount Everest actually poke into the stratosphere where sound might be bouncing back down? That's a simple Google search. And again, we have multiple reputable sources boldly disagreeing with one another. So allow me to spitball and pull an answer right out of my butt. We could call it a hypothesis. 
Doing some rough research and math, I would bet that in the winter months, with Everest sitting at the latitude of nearly 28 degrees north, it reaches into the stratosphere in the highest thousand feet or so. However, the vast majority of Everest climbers climb in May, and I would assume that the warmer regions of the stratosphere would rise far enough above the summit for the typical sound to not be able to be heard, like miles. Therefore, the tropopause would not cause a significant difference in the sound refraction. Therefore, the temperature on the peak of Mount Everest in May would likely not have any significant effect on sound volume. On to pressure. So when we break down a sound wave into more tangible properties, let's pretend that we could slow down time a bit and zoom in so we could see air molecules. And if you clapped your hands, you'd see compressions and rarefactions, which is just a very fancy way of saying some bunched up air molecules and then some spaces between the bunched up air molecules. A misconception that often bugs me a little bit is that a lot of people think that space is this steadfast vacuum and no sound can exist in it at all, and that the Earth is just this pressure chamber of atmosphere. Eh, not really. The abundance of air molecules that we enjoy and depend on for survival under 26,000 feet congregate down here for the same reason we do, gravity. If you were to just turn the gravity switch off, despite a whole bunch of other bad things happening, our atmosphere would just float off into space. And it's also worth mentioning that there isn't some sort of cutoff line for gravity and atmosphere. We attempt to define the beginning of space as something called the Kármán line, but that distinction is mostly made because that's where the sky starts appearing black. There is still atmosphere and air molecules far beyond the Kármán line, way into the exosphere. And there's certainly a whole lot of gravity, just ask the moon. But back to our mission here. We've been down this rabbit hole for a while now, and we're still left wondering, how does the air density on top of Mount Everest affect the volume of sound? I gave it a Google and I got a bunch of non-answers, but this time I even messaged a few physicists. Now, one of them was actually very generous and helpful and supplied me with some ideas on how to formalize this question into a few long pages of mathematics, which only then would require me to tack on the complex mathematics of acoustic pressure refraction on different coefficients of temperature affected by the air density itself. And you know what? I am nowhere near clever enough to do something like that. So I ordered a bunch of parts and put together a vacuum chamber and we can simulate Mount Everest right here and hopefully find out the answer. The lowest I could get the air density was just below the levels on the peak of Mount Everest. So here we have a wireless Bluetooth speaker playing a saw wave at 180 hertz, which is the average frequency of a human voice. Then I recorded it inside the chamber with a calibration microphone. I reduced the air density by a little over 30 kilopascals, killed the pump, and slowly let the air out. Listen to how the audio not only changes in volume, but quite drastically in timbre. Okay, that was fun, but the speaker driver could have malfunctioned or gotten stuck, so instead, let's try this with a natural sound source. Let's come back down to just over a thousand feet up above sea level where I live. I turned off the lights and cameras to reduce the probability of interference and did this 10 times per sound source. So finally, we have some results. The saw wave averaged at 19.88 decibels quieter at the peak of Mount Everest's altitude. 
the metronome averaged at 18.56 decibels quieter at the peak of Mount Everest's altitude. These two ranges are only off by just a little bit over a decibel, so I actually am very satisfied with the consistency. Now with my decibel meter, both of these sound sources measured close to the average conversational volume, and 19 decibels would be the difference from me talking at this volume or me talking at this volume. Or here's a more objective way of comparing the two. If you were to have a reasonably loud conversation at sea level, that conversation on top of Mount Everest would be about as loud as the ambience of a quiet bedroom. That is a surprisingly notable amount. If you liked this video or if you learned anything, subscribe to my channel, maybe even share it with somebody. If you really like this video and if you wanna have a hand in helping make future videos like this possible, hold on, I got a Patreon pitch. Hey everyone, I'm Mike Ross Lauder, a real person and definitely not AI. Ben's Patreon features a large, organized Discord community, tons of audio assets, and hundreds of hours of past live streams. And the best part is that you can join for as little as $1. Also, I have a live stream every single week, and I've moved it to a new channel that only exists for live streams. It's called Alpha Basic, and the link is in the description. All right, have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye.